Our resident poet has a little something to share with us to start. So let's let Lynn do this while we do that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I wrote this yesterday. Um, it's for all of us, you know. In play with the universe, when I remember, my choice is total absolution. Infused light knows another's as all dust is disavowed. Taste this moment in breath's vivid color. Pure energy's love exudes its aroma. Thank you. Thank you. Dear. You write poems similar to this uh, other, the, 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 is she Japanese author? For the poem you read to start? The Kristen that you read so well? They, they have the same kind of flavor to them. All right. Okay, I think I'm going to, um, in interest of time, skip. Um, let me just make one point that kind of goes back with the first part, and then we'll go into the second part, which is talking about special relationships. Well, actually, let me do this one. Uh, what Part of what I was wanting to try to share with you this earlier was the whole idea that God is life and that you're very much a part of life, and we're all very much a part of life. It's something which is alive. And as you do this course, I think what you should find or feel really is that you're even becoming more alive. By more alive, I mean that you're, you're not sleeping so much and that you have energy as well and that you're participatory in life and that you're not running away from life or you're not wasting your time just watching television or something like that. Yes. More ma'am. connection. More in More connection. More connection. is a very good word to, to describe that, right. So uh, it says, for God is life and life is as holy as the holiness by which it was created. The presence of holiness lives in everything that lives. Everything that lives, right? not just us, right? For holiness created life and leaves not what it created holy as itself. You can certainly, one of the reasons that people talk about mystical experiences occurring within the context of nature, because nature is just something which is very much there and very much alive, right? And you're talking about the chant as though you were in a, if you, I love this time of year because uh, we have a nice a deck where I live and we're not in the country, but we're kind of. And uh, do you know the Katie Dids are really doing it right now? You know, if you're in a position where you can listen to Katie Dids and tree frogs and crickets, I mean, they're, they're just singing. And they just you can just have wonderful meditations. Just uh, sit and listen to them, right? All right. Um, so the only oops. Let's do that. So I think, think of, of life as a river. And while we can't change the course of the river, we have our oars, which is also a rudder, and can control what part of the river that we're kind of going down. The idea, two of you today, I thought it was interesting, two of you today mentioned to me about just being in the flow. That, that's part of it, you know, not being obsessed and worried about it, just being in the flow, very natural. You don't have to think about what to do. You're just going along with it. Of course, uh, sometimes uh, the, the course of the river uh, becomes re requires a lot of attention. And we've got to pay it real careful to where we are at and where we're going. Uh, but you can do that as well. So let's move on now to talking about special relationships for the balance of the time that we have today. So a special relationship is any and all relationships we have created <clears throat> in order to keep our sense of separation from God being healed. All right, that's, that's, that's a simple definition from the Course. 
The ego is always on the outlook for trouble. This comes in two forms, which the Course refers to as special love and special hate. So we'll talk about what those two differences are. In a sense, the special relationship was the ego's answer to the creation of the Holy Spirit, which was God's answer to the separation. Got that? So the special relationship is the ego's answer to the creation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the solution, right? Which God gave an answer to the separation. For although the ego did not understand what had been created, the holy relationship, it was aware of the threat. That's the, the right mind. It's aware of the fact that there is a right mind. Otherwise, it would just be total chaos. The whole this defense system of the ego evolved to protect the separation from the Holy Spirit was in response to the gift with which God blessed it and by his blessing enabled it to be healed. So the creation of special relationships is a defense against the realization of our oneness with each other and thus with God. It's a defense. It keeps us from this. Another way to say this is that a special relationship is any and all relationships we have created in order to keep our sense of separation from God being healed. I think I said that. Every special relationship you have made has as its fundamental purpose the aim of occupying your mind so completely that you will not hear the call for truth. Do you hear that? Wow. Yeah, wow. See, there's a well. We keep getting the wows in the course, right? It's a, I'm going to read that again. Every special way you've made as its fundamental purpose, the aim of occupying your mind. So you ever get occupied with a special, obsessed with a special relationship, right? And you just can't let it go. And terrible things can happen. <laughs> and there are people, especially people act out and hurt another individual, for example. Right? That which, which is maybe something that happens. We get lost in special relationships. So all of our relationships are special. And so as far as we place expectations or anticipations upon other people as to how they are supposed to behave in relationship to us. And then when they don't behave that way, we become upset, disappointed, hurt, or angry with them. That's my definition. And I think it's a pretty good definition. It's just... If you, you notice that you're upset or angry or anything that, that's going on in a relationship, right? You put it there, so look at it, right? You expect this person to behave in a certain way. They don't behave that way. Now, you get to be crazy because they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Special relationships are those relationships onto which we project guilt substituting them for love and our true relationship with God, the universe. So what we were saying in the first hour today was the relationship is a relationship we have with God. That's the main, that's numeral, which automatically makes us in relationship with everyone. But special relationships are the relationships that we pull out that become problem for us. They reinforce the belief in scarcity principle that is the belief that we are empty and incomplete, le leading to our seeking others to fulfill the scarcity experience within ourselves. It's within ourselves, right? So we look for the completeness outside. So, you have married very real relationships, even in this world. That's important to know. We have made, we have made very real relationships, even in this world. Yet you don't recognize them because you raise them, their substitutes to such predominance that when truth calls to you, as it does constantly, you answer with a substitute. You put something else in its way. It's got a block in the way of the relationship. That's why I said earlier, and we'll say probably every time, let him be what he is, seek not to make of love an enemy. Right? Just let this, let this person be. So a substitute relationship is a special relationship which we raise to dominate so that blocks awareness of real relationship, which again is our relations with God and with each other. And you can have that with anyone. And hopefully you do have it with anyone. 
We are one because each part contains your memory and truth must shine in all of us as one. That's a part of what I think we were talking about earlier as a part of the ongoing memory of who we really are as a people, as a whole, and not just as friends or uh, in our immediate relationships even. As with everything, the purpose of special relationship depends on which mind we are choosing, ego or spirit. If we choose ego, then the purpose of the relation is to prove that we're right. Another one is wrong. It's really important. You do not have to be right. Sometimes it's much better to be wrong. I know. I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that sincerely, and I love my wife tremendously. But what I mean by that is, you know, you, there's no reason to be right about a lot of things, right? Or my, your opinion really doesn't matter. The love is what matters. You know, that, that's, that's the thing that we let override everything else, right? Would you rather be right or happy? Would you rather be right or happy? It all comes down to that, right? There's no reason to be right. I don't have to be right. I'll let it go, right? Why, why prove my point? That just will set the other up as an antagonist, uh, and that doesn't need to be the case. And then we got an argument going on, right? We don't need arguments. That just creates a aggravated situation. So if the ego is a symbol of the separation. It's also a symbol of guilt. Guilt is more than merely not of God. It's a symbol of attack on God. Let me ask you, anybody that want to answer this, but I'll, why is it a symbol of, sub, of attack on God? Why is guilt a symbol of attack on God? Anybody want to tackle that one? You need a mic, and you're going to have to stand up and, or, let the mic, or let the camera focus on you. <laughs> you're okay. Why is guilt, guilt a symbol of attack on God? Because God is the tool that ego uses to justify that we are separate. Right. Very good. Simple. Right. So it is a total meaningless concept except to the ego. Guilt. Right? But do not underestimate the power of the ego's belief in it, guilt. So guilt is an experience we have. This is a time factor thing going on. Guilt is our present experience we have in relationship to the past. Something happened. We hurt someone else. It's a terrible feeling. The, the feeling as though you have hurt someone else, right? Which we then carry into the present, came up, talked about this a lot, which then gives us fear of the future. The fear of the future is that you're going to be found out, or that you're going to have to pay a price, or you're going to be punished for what was done, right? We've got sin, guilt, and fear, which Ken used to refer to the big three, right? But again, sin can only be in the past. Guilt is my experience of sin in the present. Fear is my future with What's going to happen? Uh, Hannah? Because guilt is not a feeling. Guilt is a state of mind that we give ourselves to help us justify what we're going to do or not do. Good. In other words, if I am on a diet and somebody gives me a piece of cheesecake, if I eat the cheesecake, I will give myself a state of mind Oh, let me pay for that by being guilty. But if I don't eat the cheesecake, I don't need to use guilt to justify that. Right. Very good. All right? Is that clear? Okay. So there are many ways in which we attack each other in thought. you got to go around. <laughs> we attack each other um, in thought, word, and deed. The more easily attack, we more easily attack that which seems different from us. Special, special hate says I'm the victim. 
I've been abandoned, deceived, uh, abandoned again. <laughs> My suffering is due to what someone else has done to me. This, I love this. The word, it's interesting. The Course in Miracles consists of almost 500,000 words, right? Just under 480-some thousand words, right? And the word beware appears one time in the entire Course. And this is the sentence that it appears in. Beware of the temptation to perceive yourself as being unfairly treated, right? You can't be unfairly treated unless you perceive yourself as being unfairly treated. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't be unfairly treated. <laughs> but we're, we're talking about how you perceive yourself, how you perceive the situation, and whether or not it's something that you can let go of and forgive, or that you can do something about, but not with anger and not with attack, right? Not with vengeance, right? doesn't mean you don't correct a situation. So the reasoning by which the world is made, this is a long quote, which is why the earth goes on to the next second page. The reasoning by which the world is made, on which it rests, by which it is maintained, is simply this. You are the cause of what I do. Your presence justifies my wrath. And you exist and think apart from me, while you attack, I must be innocent, and what I'm suffering from is your attack. Right? No one who looks at this reasoning exactly as it is could fail to see it does not make sense. Yet it seems sensible because it looks as if the world were hurting you, and so it seems as if there's no need to go beyond the obvious in terms of cause. Cause is always out there. It's always in you. So this is an interesting. The Course makes a couple of jabs, very interestingly, at marriage. It doesn't say this. It doesn't use that terminology, right? We've got an engaged couple here. <laughs> that doesn't mean you shouldn't get married. <laughs> I'm very happy to be married. Uh, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do that. Whenever any form of special relation tempts you to seek for love in ritual, that's the point, seeking for it in ritual. Remember, love is content and not form of any kind. The special relationship is a ritual of form aimed at raising the form to take the place of God at the experience of, con of content. content. There's no meaning in the form, and there never will be. It's not the piece of paper that makes you marry, right? It's another, when I do a wedding, I say no, and part of what I say is that no wedding can make you a married couple. Only you can do that through love, compassion, understanding, you know, holding each other, seeking each other, whatever it is that you're, you're giving to each other. That's what makes the marriage. The marriage is not because there's a piece of paper. A piece of paper is something that got created by society for legal reasons, right? It actually, of course, has to do with ownership, if you're going back into far enough into things. Like, and, and we do wind up, ownership is a very important part of what the property, et cetera, and then when we get divorces, well, we know what kind of messes that can get people into, right? But the, the main thing is that the love is there. That's the main thing, right? We're all joined in the atonement here, and nothing else can unite us in this world. The atonement is the oneness with God. The atonement is the Holy Spirit's plan of correction for undoing the ego. We're trying to keep the ego out of this and heal the belief in separation. The purpose of the atonement is to restore everything to you, or rather to restore it to your awareness. What is the atonement again? Anybody? The atonement is a process by which we undo the ego so that there is no ego in play, right? If there's no ego in play, then we just are. Then we just can be in. And if you're in a married relationship, I think it's really just being, just being present for each other, knowing that that's what you have, that you have that connection. Yes, Lynn, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Stand up and turn around. About form. Um, sometimes a relationship doesn't work out in one form, but it'll work out in another form. All right. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Easily. Like, I had that. That's the when the when the Holy Spirit makes it a holy relationship from right. a special relationship. It's uh, when Some, you, you can always learn. Sometimes as well, like in a marriage, I have a couple out in uh, uh, Seattle. They're really good. They're very close. They used to be married, <laughs> but they got divorced. And they, they do have separate residences, but they're each other's best. But they spend more time with each other than anybody, and it, it's like they're married. But it's just not there. It doesn't have that form. But it, it's where their minds are at that really matters. It's, that's the connection that counts. Right? I know that firsthand. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. It's a good thing. It is. So guilt, and this is one from the Foundation for Inner Peace, is uh, uh, one of their quotations. Guilt is interference, not salvation, and serves no useful function at all. It just makes you feel awful. You know, it's a sort of dirty, stinky, awful guilt. I mean, it's like, oh, it's, a, it's not a pleasant feeling. And you're right about it being of the mind. Right. I mean, it's a choice. It's a choice in that sense to feel that way. And think about all the, all the emotions and all the feelings are really a thought. I'm thinking that I'm guilty, I'm th and which is the feeling, but I'm thinking it. It's not just a an emotion. Projection is where we find other problems which are no doubt lurking inside one's own mind. We would look out there and find the problem. But projection doesn't work as an attempt to, make the, to take the guilt in our own mind and put it onto another in the hope that by giving it to someone else, we will be free of it. And projection always boomerangs. It always comes back. So what I mean by that is I just feel more guilty because I'm making you feel guilty. <laughs> right? And so then I feel more guilty. And it just keeps multiplying in reverse, which is not what we want. So the guilt attack cycle is the thing that makes the world go round. This whole world is based on this guilt attack cycle. And it's not just people, it's nations that do it. We, you know, nations, what, what happens with nations is just a reflection of what's going on within individual psyches. Right? So the Course says this is an insane world, and we should not underestimate the extent of its insanity. It's not like one country's insane and another country's not. We're all insane. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having the kind of, and this has been going on since there's been different camps, <laughs> different tribes. You know, tribes uh, get into fights with each other. Right? There is no area of your perception that is not touched, and your dream is sacred to you. That's why God placed the Holy Spirit in us to help us to awaken from the dream. We feel guilty whenever we, we hurt someone else. Remember, of course, America says, if you attack your another, you hurt yourself. That's the boomerang. You attack air, you cannot attack, you cannot hurt somebody else and not hurt yourself. Any attempt to make, any attempt you make to correct a brother means that you believe correction by you is possible. And that's just not, that just doesn't work. And this can only be the arrogance of the ego. Correction is of God who knows nothing about arrogance. Remember what I was saying earlier, it can only be a decision within one's own mind. You can't make a decision for another person. The ego believes that the best offense is attack and wants you to believe it. Unless you do believe it, you will not side with it, and the ego feels badly in need of enemies. And allies, excuse me, <laughs> I mean, though not of brothers. Allies, but not brothers. So, 
more about defense mechanisms. So defense mechanisms, we all, if you're in, we've got several psychologists, so you all know about defense mechanisms. Is any mechanism we have created to protect ourselves from what we perceive as threats from the outside world? There are psychological strategies that are used to protect us from anxiety arising from unacceptable thoughts and feelings. Typical defense mechanisms include denial. I am not an alcoholic. I had someone literally screaming at me on the phone recently that I am not an addict. I am not an addict. I am not an addict. OK, what could I say? Not an addict. Right? Or projection, it's your fault. Problem is inside you, it's not inside me. Or repression, deliberately trying to keep information out of the conscious awareness, which doesn't work. Right? Keeps creeping back up. Uh, we, we got a microphone back for Al. John, I would yeah. I'd like to ask a question. As much as I've been into the Course in Miracles, it seems to me the special relationship gets the worst review of anything ever. In right. The course. And you just said yeah, it does. it's all about the, mech, the, the specifics of the the whole the special relationship. Right. And with all the psychologists here and all the students, couldn't we say that really understanding those those mechanisms in a really an experiential kind of conscious way is really a ladder. Yes. Wonderful. To the holy relationship. That's yeah. right. That's right. Okay. That's uh, that's been my feeling all along. Sure. But it's always a whole Special right. It's such a terrible thing. Well, it's a ladder because, but first of all, we all we all have, we all have special relationships we got with lots of things, not just our mates and stuff like that, but with each other, with people on television. We have special relationships with personalities, right? But that just looks at then I, that gives me a chance to look at what I need to heal, mm -hmm. right? That's the vehicle. That's the vehicle. The vehicle is what I get to heal, which is going to change everything. Is it gets very subtle. Very. You think you're being so loving and you're in this thing, and you have to really look into yourself to, to see where it's coming from, what's, right. what the deal is, so to speak. Right. Thank you. Right. But you can do that. I mean, that's what the whole course is about. I mean, it's about getting us to look within and stop thinking that the problem somehow or another exists in the world. There are no problems in the world except so far as the problem is in my mind, and then I project it out into the world. I mean, how does Jesus see the world? Or how does God see the world? You see, things are what they are. There's no judgment about it. There's no analysis of the situation. Right. right. It, it, it need, you see, in a, in a certain way, our, our mode is reactive and unconscious, if you want to look at it in a, a psychological sense. While we're unconscious, we're just in that loop. That's right. The difference is getting to the point where you recognize that unconscious reactivity and deciding to go against it more towards our ideas of what Holy Spirit right. means or what love means. What love means, yeah. yeah. Right, really loving. Right. That's why you know, think if you have a if you're in a special relationship like in a marriage situation, and you're going to get difficulty. Uh, Go through it. Work it out. I mean, if the love, there was a love there to start the thing, right? If the love is there to start the thing, there's no reason the love can't stay there, right? Just keep loving. <laughs> you know, as I asked what, Jesus once how to handle a particular relationship, which was not a difficult relationship for me, but uh, it was just, just keep loving and just keep, keep loving. I'm going to go back and show you. Oops. Hand up yeah. Can you, can you reach this microphone so I don't go in front of the camera? Who's going? Oh, I said I didn't see you. Whenever I... Oh, yeah, hi there, I'm Susan. Um, whenever I read this in the course about <clears throat> guilt and um, projection, there is something that always comes up, and that is people who commit horrendous crimes 
like I was watching television and these people lost their child in, in one of those mass shootings. So that means that we shouldn't blame that person for having taken away our child. Um, I had a crime committed against one of my children. And I, to be honest with you, I never really blamed that. I couldn't get that angry, and I don't know why. But um, I can understand saying that that person has brought me terrible pain. Right. I can too. So how does that fit in here? Well, it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we don't forgive them, mm -hmm. does it? And it doesn't mean that they don't have to, quote, pay for the whatever was happened, right? And don't they feel guilt? Shouldn't they feel guilt? If they don't feel guilt, there's something not right. Well, they probably do feel guilt. Mm -hmm. It's very guilt. It's unconscious guilt. OK. Right. It's going to be there. It may not be overt, but it's going to be, it can, it can help it be there. But how does that fit in the course of the teaching? In which way? Mike, Saying that Mike. guilt is something we should not have. Um, that it's oh, yeah, on a deeper sense, that's true. Yes. Right. But that doesn't mean that you can go out and, <laughs> and do things that would make you feel guilty. Okay. And then, uh, <coughs> no, you, but you got to learn, you got to turn to God at that point. And you have to forgive yourself and you have to ask for forgiveness of the other as well when you do something like that. But we don't let it, it's, I understand what you're saying. To me, there's a big difference between when my neighbor did me did something terrible to me, but she didn't harm me or my family, or so I can distance myself and do what you're talking about. Right. But in other cases, it's really a whole other thing. I hear you. So that's a big question I have. That's a big question. Thanks okay. for. I just want to show you one more slide, and this this may seem like a funny slide to show you, but um, this was I was thinking about. Um, defensiveness, and I just, out of curiosity, looked this up online, and look at this. The, on the, the blue, the United States spends, by the way, it says there, I think it says 648, it's, that can be revised up to $700 billion now, right, in defense. And we have 330 million people who live in this country. I'm just objectively speaking. We're not trying to do anything other than that. Now look at the next. The next biggest is China, which spends $250 billion on defense and has 1.5 billion people. So that's more than five times as many people, right? Just look at the, the and then Sort of thing, India has 1.4 billion people. And what do they spend? $67 million, I think it is, on defense. And then uh, Russia, Russia only has 145 million people. So look, and it's spending 6.1 billion on defense. And then we go around to Iran, just to list the high well, I'd say. It uh, has 82 million people, and it's spending. $13.2 billion on defense. I'm going to just leave that with you without comment. Just looking at how defensive we are. Right? Could I comment? I guess you can. Thank you. Um, this is one of the things Marion talks about, Marion Williams talks about. She wants to. Uh, you know, get some of the money to start a peace program, peace program instead of right. the defense. Of peace. Yeah, Department of Peace. Right. And and she says we the military is like resurgent. We need a really good military, but they don't a lot of the money that's spent for the military is spent for not for the military really. Right. So um but I won't get into it now. But we love you, Marianne. Love you. <laughs> it's five to four, and I want to do a meditation to close. Anybody? Right? Can I, can I add one thing? Oh, please. Go, go ahead. Um, it was, it's in reference to this 
concept of guilt, um, you know, it's not that any of us should feel guilt. Right. Like, if I go out and murder somebody, it's not that I should feel guilty about what I've done. Guilt is an effect that comes from a cause. If I make a choice to go out and hurt somebody, it's not that I should feel guilty about it. It's that my cause of choosing to do that, the effect of choosing to harm another, the effect is guilt. So I am going to experience guilt from the effect of choosing the cause first. So it's cause and effect. It's the most fundamental law of God, cause and effect. So if somebody does something to us, they're naturally, through effects, are going to suffer guilt. We shouldn't do the same. We should always go in our right mind and look at somebody else that's made that wrong decision and choose in our right mind so we can justify and make a correction of what's actually happened. Because if we all are going at people through defense, and in our wrong mind, there's no correction is happening. So we, we need to make sure that when we are looking at somebody that's done harm to us, that we make sure that we're doing it in our right mind, that we don't counterbalance, we're, we're, we're undoing rather than, you know, sure. exemplifying it. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah it's, yeah. you know, it, guilt is is not something that we is necessary. It's something that happens out of a wrong-minded choice. Right. You know, just as defense. Thanks, Brad. That's very clear. I'm going to do a <clears throat> short meditation. So, <clears throat> kind of keeping with what we're doing today. <clears throat> and as I often like to do, <clears throat> I suggest that there's a phrase that I'd like for you to repeat. After me, and the rephrase today is, God is the mind in which I think. Right? And I'll say, at the point, say with me, God is the mind in which I think. Okay? God is the mind in which I think. Today's idea holds the key to what your real thoughts are. They are nothing that you think you think. Just as nothing that you think you see is related to vision in any way. There is no relationship between what is real and what you think is real. Now then that you think are your real thoughts resemble your real thoughts in any respect. Nothing that you think you see bears any resemblance to what vision will show you. Say with me, God is the mind with which I think. You think with the mind of God Therefore, you share your thoughts with him, as he shares his with you. They are the same thoughts, because they are thought by the same mind. To share is to make alike or to make one. Nor do the thoughts you think with the mind of God leave your mind, because thoughts do not leave their source. Therefore, your thoughts are in the mind of God as you are. They are in your mind as well, where he is, as you are part of his mind. So are your thoughts part of his mind. Where, when are your thoughts real? You will have to look for them in your mind, because that is where they are. They must still be there because they cannot leave their source. What is thought by the mind of God is eternal, being part of creation. Say with me, God is the mind with which I think. We are attempting to leave the unreal and seek for the real. We will deny the world in favor of truth. We will not let the thoughts of the world hold us back. We will not let the beliefs of the world tell us that what God would have us do is impossible. Instead, we will try to recognize that only what God would have us do is possible. Say with me, 
God is the mind with which I think. Only what God would have us do is what we want to do, and we cannot fail in doing what he would have us do. There is every reason to feel confident that we will succeed. It is the will of God. Repeat with me, God is the mind with which I think. To try to go past all the unreal thoughts that cover the truth in your mind and reach to the eternal. Under all the senseless thoughts and mad ideas with which you have cluttered up your mind are the thoughts that you thought with God in the beginning. They are there in your mind now and completely unchanged. They will always be in your mind exactly as they always were. Say with me, God is the mind with which I think. You may be unable to yet to realize how high you are trying to go. This is no idle game, but the exercise is holy in holiness and an attempt to reach the kingdom of heaven. Say with me, God is the mind with which I think. Appreciate your mind's holiness. Stand aside briefly from all thoughts that are unworthy of him, whose host you are, and thank him for the thoughts he is thinking with you. And one last time, say with me, God is the mind with which I think. Thank you. So just a comment about uh, next in October. I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be at that retreat in North Carolina. And uh, David Fishman, my partner in the One Man Foundation, uh, David has uh, been with the Course in Miracles for a really long time. In fact, as I remember, you may, may know the story of my talking him into leading a Course in Miracles group beginning in 1980. It, uh, New Year's Eve party at my house. He said, why don't you start a group? And he did. And so he's been very immersed in the course ever since. And uh, please come and support David, and I will be back with you in November. I don't know what the topic is going to be, but I'm thinking about talking about the very important concept of willingness. Our willingness to do something. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.